Okay, so uh, uh, without any more ado, I think I should introduce um, our first speaker, who's uh, Liam Maxwell, um, ICT Futures UK Cabinet Office, as it says in the official biography you've all got in front of you. I'm not sure it's that official, but anyway, the one that's printed there. But I can let you into a few other secrets. His commitment to openness um, stems back to his time as a paid footballer. And, and I think it relates to the concept of the open goal. Um, but I'm not sure. Maybe he could fill us in on that uh, uh, somewhere uh, down the line. So Liam, if you'd like to come and uh, give your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Yes, being a I'd, I'd said I get paid to play football in my last job. That's because I was a teacher. So uh, I'm afraid I'm not uh, someone who graces the, uh, the lands. And it's great to be here. I, I think I am being videoed the last time that I was videoed uh, um, was also with Chris Taggart in the audience, who's sitting here today. And it was Chris who was trying to video us. We committed in our local government to um, allowing meetings of public sessions of councils to be videoed. And Chris sat there videoing, and some of my most reactionary colleagues suddenly managed to get him ejected, which was a fantastic way of showing the stupidness of those that fight against openness, because it looked ridiculous. And of course, the video was wonderful. Oh, lots of sort of people going, get out, and very British ways of getting people to stop. And it made me think about transparency a little more. And transparency, we all think that transparency and openness is very good, and we get it. And it's rather like being an environmentalist about 20 years ago, when people started talking about global warming. And the tide, you know, that's an accepted thing. Now, the only people I know, in fact, it's the similar people that I know who uh, wanted Chris out of that room that day, are the people that don't get global warming. And the, their problem is not that they don't get the warming, it's the global they don't get. Um, so I'd like to um, start by saying thank you very much for having me. I'd also like, everyone says when they come here, they say thank you to Graham, and Graham runs a great shipper. But one of the reasons I'm here is actually because of someone um, who generally sits in the background and just lobbies very quietly in a deliberate way. And I don't think we can go through today without recognising that one of the reasons that I've moved towards this agenda, and in many ways my colleagues move towards this agenda, is because of Basil Cousins, who is a very great advocate for free thinking and openness. And I don't think we should go through today without recognising his contribution to that. Um, at the start of February, the British government minister announced the launch of a new crime mapping website, and the, the response was electric. Um, the site was deluged with thousands of hits from an extremely interested public, and the site quickly crashed for a brief period because the traffic flow was so huge, um, and it was unprecedented. It was, like, it was more than a Saturday night TV reality show got. And Police.UK now stands as, a, as an example of the public's attitude for useful data about their community. And it's been delivered in a nice, user-friendly way. We all have views about the way that it's delivered and the granularity, but because it was there in an easy and simple way to see public data, it got ahead. But we also made sure that the raw data was published next to the site. And that is a core component of what we've been doing. So open data has started to be a fundamental force for change within our government. Openness is at the heart of the coalition's purpose. It's able to radically redistribute power from the elites in the centre to people in their communities. And that's a core belief that runs through the approach to government that we have at the moment. The old way of running bureaucratic services where power, information, control is centralised doesn't work. It's not that it costs too much, though it does, it's that it fundamentally pushes power into the hands of the elites in the centre and ignores local communities, and it can't go on. In all other aspects of their lives, citizens have the ability to make informed choices about the services that they consume. We have price comparison sites, sites like Confuse.com or Skyscanner, which enable comparisons that were once very difficult to be made very quickly. And these deal with competing services in dynamic markets, insurance and flights in those two examples, and they allow comparison of apples with apples. That's a core benefit of what they do. And these are now relatively mature markets. There are very strong competitors in those markets. Government 
hasn't really recognised in many ways how ready the citizen is to do the same thing with government services. But in the UK, we've tried to go ahead with that as fast as we can. And please note as well that those services I mentioned run on free data, data that's available for free, like beer free. It's important that it's like that. So it's clear that there's an appetite for online services, and if there's a compelling reason for people to go online, they will. My background, I'm now an official um, within government. I was a politician, so I, I had views. Three weeks ago, I had political views, and now I don't um, at all. And, but we ran a community um, called Windsor and Maidenhead, which was a government lab. We were allowed to try out new things, and so one of the things we tried out, and we got back in to do it, we paid our public to recycle. Because it made economic sense to pay the residents to recycle. We made more money, and we saved more money doing that than not. Our recycling went up a lot, which was good, but also our landfill tax went down a great deal. And that was why we did it. But we also got 64% of our residents online. And we can communicate with them effectively, clearly, so that if the snow affects their bin collection, we can get to them quickly. That's a way of using personal data to get people online, to get people engaged and start delivering better services. And so in the UK, as you may know, we've seen quite a lot of the transparency of accountability. You will have seen the MP's expenses, Farago, of a couple of years ago. And, but we're going beyond just the accountability, the, the sort of exposure, the journalists saying, oh, I've just discovered this. Actually, we've now embedded open data and transparency within our government, and we have a department that is aimed at doing this, and it's run by a fantastic guy called Tim Kelsey, and his job is to embed transparency within the British government approach. And where it gets important is that we're using transparency to make change. We're using open data to make change. You may have heard of the famous letter that was left behind by the previous government, which literally said, Dear Mr Chief Secretary, I'm terribly sorry, there is no more money. And that is the situation we are in at the moment. There is no more money to spend on change. We can only get change moving by using transparency, open data, comparison, and helping people make the right decisions at that point. So if we take the spending data that we've published, and I think the guys, if they press the button, they should pull up some spending data, transparency. Back, first slide. Button. There we go. Um, Chris will wince at this. But this was a signal example of trying to get our data out onto the internet to show how much money we spent. And this now happens for every local government in the UK. Now, there are big issues that we learned on that way about open government licensing, about making this data free and open, which were good for us to learn. And we learned because people challenged us and we were open to challenge. But this data allows us to compare our services with the services of another council that does exactly the same thing. It's that comparison. It enables people to open up and see where they can save money, and it also enables people to see where they can make changes. I'll give you another example of how we can make change happen by making stuff open. All of the energy usage that we have in our offices is published online. So rather than go around and tell people to turn the lights off, we just publish their energy use every half hour online. And that's public. And we save 25% overnight. Because people didn't want to get rung up and said, you've left the lights on. And that's a way of using transparency to make behavior change without becoming micromanaging. Because we're all being adult about the way that we do this. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about today, is how can we use transparency for change? The crime data we mentioned previously, what that did was that showed us where the um, pockets of crime were. It also showed us that the systems we use to connect all that crime data and to put it together need some work. And we could do things in a much smoother and effective way. It also means that we can transfer the idea of having a crime map where you see a crime, you can then, on the map, you can see what happened to it. Was somebody prosecuted for it? What happened at that point? Now that information is fantastically useful and also helps with the trust and the effective working of our court services and those systems. Now we're working to push that through and possibly the most energetic and I think brave minister in the government, Nick Herbert, is the guy who's pushing that through. 
And that's going to be a fundamental reform to the way that our government works. And so I'll give you another example. As we start the um, implementation of our ambitious national IT strategy, which is about to be published um, at the beginning of October, the implementation plan, the detailed plan, we've embedded within that plan clearly transparent metrics, which allow us to see what our IT costs, whether what we're doing is working. We are not setting targets, because if you set a target, someone will change their behavior to meet the target. We are just publishing the data. If it goes the wrong way, people will know. So we're publishing price per desktop. We're going to publish the, um, the cost per server. We're going to publish the price per citizen for some services, which allows us to compare how things work, to compare apples with apples, and to compare outcomes with people so that we can drive the change we want, which is towards a cheaper, more effective, and better utility computing model. We therefore are taking the opportunity to also shift our service delivery mechanism. And one of the key things we're doing there is using people who really know how to put information out. The government digital service in Britain has recently been taken over by Mike Bracken, who was very famous for making the Guardian digital service an excellent data journalism example. And Mike's driving through change there, which will make public services much more accessible to people in a single place where you don't have all the branding issues of different government departments, where it's open. The thing we found, actually, and Mike's team came, were really clear about this, that people don't, if you want a government service, you want to go to a government site. You don't really care who's providing the service until it goes wrong. That's when you need to know. And so it's a better way of getting services across to people. So it's an exciting and it's a challenging time, and, and we've got the capability now in place to make those changes. Um, but at the root of our government, our post-bureaucratic approach, is that we believe citizens must be able to choose their services, and open data gives people that choice. We no longer believe that you should get what you're given from the state. You should be able to choose the services that you provide, and that requires open data, more supply, and it also means open standards, and the ability to have open standards of data and open standards for interoperability in government. And what's exciting is that we can now create, we're in the position to create the IT architecture to support that public service agenda. For the first time, we've got policy and technology in the same place. We have a minister who gets it. We have an executive team in Downing Street that get it, that understand the importance of data and open data in making these moves forward. And we've committed politically to become the most open government in Europe, and we're continually open to challenge to try and get there. And it's very interesting to hear the French example because immediately both Chris and I sat down and thought, all oh, right, I've got to find out they're going to get ahead. Because competitively, they will at the moment, and that's good. And we need to continually try to be ahead. But we're working in the same direction. And it also means that we are focusing on the importance, and I think I, most of you will agree with this here, of interoperability of software is absolutely key to our ability to use that and use openness to transform our public services. Open standards is one of the key knotty problems people have banged on about for years, and we have a definition of open standards which we need to make sure works, and that's one of our key tasks. We need to introduce a level playing field for the way that we buy our software and who we buy our software from. Now, if I give you an educational example, for 30 years Britain has been going on about equal opportunities. And equal opportunities sounds great, but actually is one of the reasons we're in the mess we're in. Because what we meant when we said that was equal access to opportunity. And we didn't do that. And so in an education space, you must have equal access to the best schools. When we're talking to our small, medium companies, we need to give them equal access to the opportunity to work for the government. Not preferential treatment, but equal access. When we're talking about the software we use, we don't want to be beholden to, it's, it's, it's iniquitous, iniquitous that a state could be beholden to one particular company or two particular companies. So we need to be in a position where we have equal access to the ability to supply different types of software. And that's clear we have a level playing field. That's what I mean when I say we have a level playing field for open source within the British government procurement system. 
we need to focus on value in procurement. As a government, we've never really controlled our own destiny in that sense. We've always outsourced large amounts of it. And there's a key move now, and the main uh, CIO group within government are grasping the nettle and gaining control of our own destiny in terms of procurement of IT services. And we also need to focus on the um, core cross-government version, that is, if we are going to have open standards, that then allows us to work on a cross-government basis and therefore deliver the commodity services that we need to deliver in a much more cost-effective way. Because if we can have a common hosting solution, we will save money. If we have a common public sector network solution, we will save money. It's in those core areas where standards work. And the public sector network is a great example of that as a success moving forward. We also need to have a strong think about the right to data and about how we let data be open to the public and that's one of the areas where the public data corporation debate is taking us and that's a very strong debate and we welcome your challenges on that because we firmly recognize that we certainly don't have a mon monopoly on the right ideas in that space we want to know what people think so we're moving towards a much more open government across our government and it's made possible by I give you two core components of it. It's made possible by open data. It's made possible by knowing what we me measuring what we need to know and then comparing it. Allowing us to compare apples with apples will drive us to a better place in terms of our procurement and also in our service delivery. And it also means that we have open standards throughout government in terms of software interoperability so we can use things more effectively and use the resources we have and get better services than we have before while spending less money. And as you probably realize, at the end of the day, that's where the focus needs to be. We need to deliver a better government, and we need to do it, but for less money. And we think and we firmly believe that the commitment to open standards and openness gives us the energy to get there. We have no money to spend driving this. We can only do it with a force, and that force is transparency. So thank you for listening. I'll be very welcome to, I'm very um, pleased to welcome your questions on it and also your feedback and say where we need to change. Thank you.